Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christie Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I'm Associate Director here. Um, if this is your first time tuning in with us, the Lumen Christie Institute was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a vital part of the university and our broader society through courses, lectures, non-credit um, non -credit courses and summer seminars. And we are committed here to presenting the breadth and depth of the Catholic intellectual tradition, and thus are excited to be hosting a series highlighting the scholarship of those who work in the Eastern Christian tradition. I'm especially excited this week to be hosting UChicago's own expert in Syriac studies, Aaron Walsh. Our series will be taking a break for a bit and will return on Thursday, November 12th, with a special lecture by Archbishop Boris Gudziak, Archbishop of the Ukrainian Catholic Archeparchy of Philadelphia and Metropolitan of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the USA. His presentation will be entitled, Quo Vadis, the Direction of Eastern Catholic Theology, a Pastoral Perspective for the 21st Century. Um, we'll get a link in the chat so that you can register today for that event. Um, between now and then, we have several great upcoming events, including a science and religion lecture um, featuring the president of the Society of Catholic Scientists, Steve Barr, an event and an event commemorating the 75th anniversary of the UN, featuring, among others, the Holy See's representative to the UN and Mary Ann Glendon and more. <clears throat> the best way to stay up to date in all of our programs um, is to join our mailing list today. And we'll also post a link for that in the chat as well. Um, I'm grateful to the many co-sponsors who have made this series possible. This series is co-presented with the Godbearer Institute and co-sponsored by the Beatrice Institute, the Calvert House Catholic Center, the Catholic Theological Union, the Institute for Faith and Culture, God With Us Online, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Metropolitan Andrei Sheptisky Institute of Eastern Christian Studies, the Nova Forum, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University, the St. Benedict Institute, the St. Paul University Catholic Center, St. Stephen Byzantine Catholic Church, and the Tabor Life Institute. You too can help make our events a success um, by helping to get word out to your friends and parishes um, or to follow us on social media and share our materials. Um, if you're tuning in from YouTube today, you could even help us just by liking the video and helping the algorithms let other people know about today's event. Um, you can also help us by financially supporting our work by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind goes a long way. Um, let us now turn to today's event to introduce our speaker and moderate our conversation. I'll hand it over to Father Andrew Summerson, co-organizer of this series, priest in the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Parma, serving St. Mary's Parish in Whitting and a patristic scholar in his own right. Father Andrew, I invite you to unmute yourself and turn on your screen. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real privilege to be with you tonight. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gone to the eye doctor lately, but if you have, uh, one of the uh, more unfortunate procedures that you have to have done is to get your pupils dilated. And in so doing, it allows for your eye to receive more light. Well, this is what is happening uh, tonight with our speaker, uh, Professor Erin Walsh. She's here to dilate our vision, to let in more light uh, through uh, the Syriac Christian tradition. Uh, I will here give you a biography of Professor Erin Walsh. She is an assistant professor of New Testament and early Christian literature in the University of Chicago Divinity School. She studies ancient and late antique Christianity with a focus on Syriac language and literature and received her PhD from Duke University. Her current research focuses on the reception of biblical literature and the growth of asceticism within the Eastern Roman and Persian empires. Dr. Walsh is working on a book project examining the 
Nachleben of unnamed New Testament women in Syriac and Greek poetry, highlighting the work of Narsai of Nisbis, Jacob of Shurug, Romanos Melodus. She teaches and writes upon a variety of topics in New Testament literature, the history of biblical interpretation, Syriac language and literature, embodied practices, religious poetry, and multilingualism in the late antique and early Byzantine East. She is an affiliated faculty member with the Center of the Study of Gender and Late Antique Byzant and Early Byzantine and Sexuality and the Joyce Z and Jacob Greenberg Center of Jewish Studies at the University of Chicago. During the 2018 and 2019 academic year, she was a junior fellow in Byzantine Studies at Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and a collect and collection of Harvard University. Professor Walsh also serves as the executive editor for Christianity at Ancient Jew Review, a nonprofit web journal devoted to the interdisciplinary study of ancient Judaism. She will look toward her work in Syriac literature, literature and will expand our archive, expand our treasury uh, to help understand the tradition of early Christianity today. At the end of her talk, you will have a chance uh, to hear a question and answer session. And I remind you that at any point during uh, Professor Walsh's talk, you can ask a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. With that in mind, uh, I now invite Professor Walsh to unmute herself and to show her screen as she will expand the archive, Syriac Christianity and the early Christianity today. Great. Thank you so much for a very kind and generous introduction. And I'm grateful to Lumen Christi and the co-sponsors of this series for including me. Uh, and thanks to all of you for tuning in and taking the time uh, to learn more about uh, Syriac literature and early Christianity. I think it's so important that the research, the teaching of universities uh, become accessible to the larger society. And I think the work of Lumen Christi and uh, its associated organizations is making that possible. So I'm excited to be a part of this. Studying the ancient world underscores the fact that our, that our historical record is fragile and partial. I often remind my students that the texts that have come down to us, as well as the archaeological record, is just a trace. It's a window onto the richness and the complexity of the ancient world. Being aware of this not only reminds us that our reconstructions will often be incomplete, but also that preserving and caring for our historical record is of paramount importance. When I thought about the ways that I could contribute to this series, it occurred to me that drawing attention to the critical role of manuscripts, their preservation, editing, and translation in advancing the fields of early Christianity, Syriac studies, biblical studies, uh, would raise awareness of how critical this work is and how important it is that we have, uh, that we're training graduate students and supporting scholars in this work. Uh, and I also created a PDF of some introductory readings as well as uh, online resources for you to explore. Um, yeah, I think uh, CRX Studies has been ahead of the curve when it comes to digital humanity. So I, I'll point out a few of the organizations doing that, but um, I really wanted to call attention to my colleagues who are on the front lines of that. So I wanted to take a step back for those of you who are new to the study of Syriac literature and to this uh, body of texts, and also to talk about the ways that it is continuing to change how we tell the history of Christianity. Um, after speaking a bit about uh, our sources, I wanted to pick up a thread from Dr. Hayes's lecture on Ephraim. Uh, specifically the ways that the study of Syriac literature underscores the importance of poetry within the formation of Christian thought and doctrine and, um, and heritage, both in late, late antiquity and I would argue even into the modern day. I'm going to turn to two po poets that are uh, Ephraim's literary heirs, if you will, Narsai of Nisibis and Jacob of Sarug. And I'll call attention to the ways that poetry was a vehicle of theological thought, as well as a key site for interpreting and inhabiting scripture. 
These poems were performed within the liturgy, within the schools, and they opened up new avenues uh, for, for, and they opened up new avenues for us to think about how the role of women and women's voices in early Christianity, uh, the, the formation of Christian selves and faithful uh, believers and so much more. So I just wanna open up the PowerPoint. So after Greek and Latin, the third largest body of early Christian texts was composed in Syriac. Syriac refers to the literary language used by Christians living in large parts of Syria and Mesopotamia from the second century onwards. Syriac is a form of East Aramaic. Uh, another form of East Aramaic is Babylonian Aramaic, which is the language of the Talmud. Syriac authors themselves also referred to their language as Orhayak, connecting their language with, to the city of Urhai or Edessa, present day Urfa in southeastern Turkey. And I gave a little, I circled it on our map there. Inscriptions dating between the first and third century CE proceed and bear a relationship to the literary language um, of Edessa that became Syriac. And all of our authors have a connection to Edessa. Thus, Syriac literature gives us access to Christians who lived at the very Eastern uh, territories of the Roman Empire, as well as within the Persian and, uh, and the Persian Empire as well, really in this boundary area. Um, I think so much of our traditional historiography, how the history of Christianity has been written, has been written from the perspective of Latin and Greek authors. And something that Syriac gives us is, is it shifts our perspective. It gives us uh, a, a, uh, more resources for thinking about how Christianity arose in a multilingual and religiously complex area right from the very beginning. Um, these are Christians who would be living alongside uh, in those who practice indigenous polytheistic religions as well as Jews, Manichaeans, Zoroastrians, and Christians of various stripes. And a lot of this literature gives us insight into how different authors negotiated those differences. Um, while we have several Syriac, uh, several thousand Syriac manuscripts in existence, uh, these form the basis for the study of the language and its literature. This is the archive that we have to work with. Manuscripts represent the collected efforts of scribes and communities investing time, energy, and resources copying and handing down these texts. And here we're going to look at a couple of uh, places where these are housed or were housed. Today, many of these manuscripts are uh, kept in European in North American libraries, as well as in Middle Eastern monasteries. The work of Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, as well as Brigham Young, Young's work at the Vatican has advanced the work of digitization, which we're gonna see a bit tonight. Um, and that allows scholars greater access to these works. A number of uh, Syriac manuscripts from a very early period have been preserved because they found their way to two Egyptian monasteries. And I think this is an important uh, kind of moment within the study of, of uh, or within the history of Syriac Christianity. Um, so two of them, you may have heard of one, but I wanted to call attention uh, to the monastery of the uh, Syrians in Egypt. Um, and this is a catalog that's been made of the manuscripts and fragments of manuscripts um, by Sebastian Brock and Lucas von Rumpai. Um, and what's I think so interesting about uh, you know, the story of the Monastery of the Syrians here is a figure that I gave you a reference to Sebastian Brock's article about um, Moshe of Nisibis. He was the abbot of the Syrian monastery, Orthodox monastery. And between 927 and 932, he had to travel to Baghdad on official business for the monastery. And he brought back with him 250 books. And we know this from, his, from the notes that accompany some of these manuscripts. And because of this, because of his zeal for uh, collecting books and for bringing something back with him, um, we have some very, very early manuscripts. And as many of you know, we're always excited about the earliest manuscript that we can find. Um, and Sebastian Brock places the number at about 136 of these manuscripts that are explicitly dated uh, 
to prior to 1000. <clears throat> and of course, also um, many of you might be familiar with the Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. This is one of the famous, uh, famous palimpsests um, of the, of the um, old Syriac uh, New Testament was of course discovered here. Um, so these are two very important places where Syriac manuscripts were housed and preserved. And as with so many uh, uh, papyri and manuscripts, Egypt has the dry climate that just allows uh, these texts to be preserved. So it has the natural uh, conditions for that. So these, and what I also wanted to draw attention to was that these uh, repositories of early manuscripts they are made up of specific, uh, this, the, the contents of these treasure troves is very important. <clears throat> so the fact, so the fact that we have uh, the full hymn cycles of Ephraim and so many of his complete madrashe, and even the demonstrations of an author such as Afrahat is because these early manuscripts were preserved. Um, even our records of hagiography, for example, uh, John of Ephesus and his lives of the Eastern saints, is the complete text is preserved within a manuscript dated to 688. So these are very important moments within um, preserving and keeping Syriac tradition. <clears throat> and one of the other points that emerges from these facts is that uh, over time, different authors are copied, different texts become more popular. Um, and that's, it, it's, but some authors don't, their, their fuller uh, bodies of literature are not copied in the same way. It might be more selective what's copied and what isn't, or some of those copies simply don't exist and don't come down to us. Um, we do have full, uh, fuller collections of the poetry of someone like Jacob of Sarub that were copied in the 11th and 12th century. So we do see uh, that these traditions carry on even into the 20th century and today. So, this also raises another important point about these later uh, centuries in the preservation of Syriac manuscripts. The manuscript of uh, Dar al Syrian, the monastery of the Syrians in Egypt, is uh, Syrian Orthodox in its affiliation. And even though we do see uh, some manuscripts from the Church of the East, we the, most of the manuscripts will reflect the authors that are pro, that are um, preserved within that tradition. The same thing with uh, St. Catherine's Monastery is that that will uh, chiefly transmit manuscripts within the Melkite tradition. So while foundational authors such as Ephraim are shared among um, different ecclesial uh, groups, we don't have the same repository for East, uh, East Syriac um, manuscripts. And that's why many of the manuscripts for East Syri Syriac authors are quite a bit later and that's what I'm going to turn to now. So, so one of the authors that is particularly important um, for my work will be uh, the author Narsai of Nisibis. Now Narsai, he dies in about 500. And he will study and learn at the school of Edessa. He's part of uh, He's living at a time where a lot of Theodore of Mopsuesti is being translated into Syriac. And he is going to be a part of the Christological controversies. That's often how he's been studied as a part of um, kind of the, the doctrinal uh, disagreements that happen around Ephesus and Chalcedon. Uh, but Narsai wrote, we have 81 extant memra. So, so these are narrative poems. Narrative poems that often retell biblical stories. And what I was interested in is that um, I was interested in looking at uh, how biblical stories around women were retold by Syriac authors. And at the beginning of my dissertation work, I became aware of the fact that not all of Narsai's poems appear in modern printed editions. And one of those poems that doesn't appear in those editions is his, um, his Memra on the Canaanite woman. And that's what you're looking at here. <clears throat> so um, this, uh, this manuscript, um, this uh, Memra, 
uh, is it survives in purportedly about four manuscripts. That's what um, at the beginning of the 20th century, what was known to exist of this particular Mambra. And I hope that uh, this is this case study about the Canaanite woman is gonna call attention to uh, how important it is to be editing and creating editions of these manuscripts because uh, they're, you know, they're subject, they're such a fragile resource for us to maintain. So what you're looking at here, <clears throat> this is the second oldest surviving manuscript for Narcissus poetry. Uh, this is Dear Becker Manuscript 70. This has been digitized at Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. And this is actually the first uh, folio of uh, this Mamre. Um, this particular manuscript was copied in Erbil uh, in modern day Iraq around 1328. And this manuscript contains 38 of his poems, uh, thir well, 35 belong to Narsai and three others don't. <clears throat> um, the other manuscript uh, that's extant of this particular Mamre uh, is housed at the Vatican Library and has been digitized by BYU. And you can see how beautiful both of these manuscripts are. The hands are very, very clear. <clears throat> um, this is Vatican Syriac Manuscript 594. This manuscript was copied in 1918 by a Syrian Orthodox deacon in Mosul for a priest from Diyarbakir, the city it's in southeastern Turkey. Um, there are two further manuscripts that were um, attributed. They were copied in the 19th century. So again, quite late for the Church of the East, these manuscripts were, and they're still being copied even into the 20th century and today. Um, and they were both housed at the Chaldean Patriarchate. Uh, originally located in Baghdad, and we don't have access uh, to these manuscripts and they may be destroyed. So I had these two manuscripts to work with. Um, and luckily doing the addition, they're both very close. So that there's not a lot of variance between these manuscripts. Uh, so we're seeing a very um, <clears throat> stable transmission history between these two texts. So with that, I wanted to think about what, what does this poem, what, is, what do these poems show us? And to talk a little bit about the form of the main rock. So I'm gonna go back to my slideshow for a second. So in looking at the Mamre and the form of these narrative poems that, that retold biblical stories, we're seeing how Christians from all different walks of life would have heard and, and learned the Bible, learned biblical stories, and also be formed as Christians. And uh, I looked at, uh, in my test case, that I wanted to show you uh, a poem, these poems on the Canaanite woman, what both Narsai and his younger contemporary, Jacob of Sarug, what they drew out of these poems, theologically, um, but also about the formation of the self. And both of them, we're going to see very common themes and how they dealt with this particular story. And just to refresh uh, some of you, if you don't remember the Canaanite woman within the New Testament, this is a story from Matthew, Matthew 15, uh, 21, 28. And this is the woman who comes to Jesus um, <clears throat> because her daughter, she claims, has been possessed by demons and she seeks Jesus's aid. Um, this is the a story that's also found as a variant in Mark is the Syrophoenician woman. And uh, even though she is identified as a Canaanite, uh, she knows that she addresses Jesus as the son of David. Now, some of you who are familiar with this text might know that it raises some tricky exegetical problems. The portrait of Jesus within uh, this text, some people, you know, gives people pause, uh, both in the ancient world and also today. She's not as popular among uh, early Christian um, homilists. I mean, Augustine has a homily on her and so do Greek, we have Greek homilies of Chrysostom, but she's not, she doesn't have, get the amount of attention that someone like the, the woman who's identified as the sinful woman or Mary or even the hemorrhaging woman uh, receives. She's a little bit um, more obscure. And one of the problems that both Narsai and Jacob of Sarug are going to deal with is how, how do you handle Jesus's initial silence and his, his reticence to help her? Um, so I'm going to go through a few uh, passages 
from uh, these poems and kind of draw out what I'm seeing and what I'm interested, I, I think is so interesting what these texts contribute to our understanding of not only how the Bible was retold and interpreted, but also how uh, poets inhabited and thought about uh, women uh, to think about the Christian life and what sort of values did they bring to that. So one of the key words, the key uh, themes within these poems <clears throat> is the idea of boldness. So we're gonna go through, I'm gonna read a few quotations from it. Um, so here is the first one, and I think it brings out a very important word for Narsai. Um, Not as one unwilling to heal did he, Jesus, turn away and remain silent, but he wanted people to gain boldness, chutzpah, and if you recognize that word, it's in the Syriac, when asking for mercy. By her boldness, bahutzpah, he taught everyone to be bold in asking for aid and not to grow weak if one does not receive aid quickly. So within one of the problems that Narsai, and even today when modern exegetes deal with this story, there's a um, there's a concern about, did this woman persuade uh, Jesus? Did he change his mind because she persists, right? He says it's not right to, to give the food um, to, to dogs, to give the food of children to the, the dogs. And she says, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And of course, uh, you know, she's famous for speaking back to Jesus and one of the ways that Narsai and Jacob are going to work through this problem is to think about how Jesus is drawing the woman out, drawing her, that she needs to have boldness in the pursuit of faith. Um, one of the interesting, you know, I think boldness is, a, is maybe an unfamiliar um, or less talked about virtue within the Christian life. And that's what we're going to see here is being lauded and thinking about how boldness and zeal uh, fit in and how this woman is made to be an example for all Christians of boldness. So uh, Jacob of Sarug also dedicates a Mamra to her story. <clears throat> and this exists, this is already in a published uh, translation that I give the link to here. Um, and Jacob is a little bit younger. His dates are 451 to 521. Like Narsai, he studies in Edessa, um, and he, whereas Narsai is driven out and is moves to Nisibis within Persian territory, uh, Jacob will go out into the area of uh, Saru, uh, where he becomes a bishop. And he, uh, even though there's a lot written on his particular Christological uh, adherence, and there's a, I can also add some uh, bibliography if people are interested in the Christological controversies and the role of these two poets. Um, uh, but here it's a little, it's, it's interesting that they both choose to write on very similar biblical stories. So I'm, I'm always interested when they both uh, choose these texts, um, even though we don't, I don't know whether they were aware of each other's poetry, <clears throat> for, at least on these texts. Um, so for Jacob, he writes that boldness opens his treasury and it was clear for her. And as such as she wants to, she wants, she collects riches from his treasury house. This is a very similar, and this is an image that is uh, familiar to those of you who have read deeply in Ephraim, that idea of the, tr the divine treasury. Had the Canaanite woman grown weary when she was held back, not even the boldness of her faith would have been praised. Jesus rejoiced that she crossed the threshold boldly. So you see both poets repeat constantly the same, the same word. And if you do not grow weary, he will enlarge your faith. So again, there's a connection between how these women exemplify that type of um, the Christian life that go, the Christian that goes out in that one must seek, um, must seek Jesus, must seek faith and, and testify to their own faith. Um, <clears throat> another, uh, aspect of these poems that I think it contributes to how we teach, how we think about the Christian tradition is when it comes to the role of women and women's voices, uh, women being pictured as uh, 
as having agency and being and uh, speaking and inhabiting their voices. Um, so here's another passage that I think exemplifies the type of virtue that Jacob wants to, to um, focus on. The woman grasped him in the midst of the crowd with a loud voice. And while they were rebuking her, she did not cease from seeking his aid. And she did not listen to him that she should turn back from him when she did not receive. She grasped him in love and he granted her requests. And then he changed course. She disputed with him and he praised her because she was victorious. For love has the power not to be rebuked even if it acts daringly. Oh, behold, woman, how very great is your faith. He revealed her to the multitude so that everyone might act boldly and imitate her. Her boldness, which is full of wonder, take for yourself, O oh man, and through it, boldness, you will be able to expel suffering when it enters you. So a few things that I think is so uh, important that this passage brings out is that one has to take note that boldness, audacity is probably a, a, a good kind of English. We have boldness and audacity is usually the negative side of that is often attributed to Eve. So it's a, it's a, it's a very delicate kind of two-sided, um, both a virtue and a vice if it's used uh, improperly. And, uh, you know, I've been writing and thinking about how Tamar and Eve and the women before Solomon, as well as the Canaanite woman, are all characterized by their boldness, but of course it's colored by their love. And here you see the connection between boldness and love. One ought to be bold, uh, inspired by a, a holy or sanctified love. But turning back to Narsai, um, one of the things that happened this is a quite quite a long poem. Um, I, I'll, I'm in the process of working to publish it. It's going to be coming out with Gorgias Press. Um, is that uh, this is um, a story that Narsai expands, and he expands it by giving the woman, the Canaanite woman, a lineage. He connects her as a Canaanite to the curse of Ham. And suddenly, and this is not a theme that I've seen in other authors working with her text yet, is that she becomes enslaved. And the slaver is actually to Satan. So Satan becomes a very important character. And in the poem, I didn't, I didn't put it up here, but there's a very long prologue that rehearses um, you know, Satan and the demons and how that's the actual struggle. Is not, she, it's not just that she's, um, it, she's interfacing with Jesus, but that she's actually you know, in, in a struggle with Satan, um, not only for the, the, well, the well-being of her daughter, but herself uh, as a Canaanite. And here we see where one of the things that happens within these Memra is that women who have small speaking roles within the New Testament or don't speak hardly at all um, or are silent gain speaking roles. They, they, their speech is expanded uh, and made more complex. And that's something that Narsai does. And I'm only gonna read one passage that's an example of that, but there are several more that I could point to. The accursed one's daughter called out before the son of the righteous one resoundingly. <clears throat> son of David, have pity and set me free in my enslavement from the captor. Son of Abram, rich in love, have pity upon the daughter of Canaan and save my life from the bondage of slavery to the evil one. The father of your father cursed my fathers through the mouth of the hidden one and subjected them to the heavy yoke of the accuser. Noah cursed our father who mocked and derided him impudently, and he blessed your father who honored and loved wisely. Just as the, with a rod, the just one chastened the one bold of heart. Again, we're seeing that. And behold, the punishment was extended to his offspring up till now. Enough has our audacity been punished with the scourges of our father in, with, with scourges our father endured, as we have become servants to the servant who rebelled against the maker. Enough has the iniquitous tyrant subjected the freedom of our souls as he mocked and derided the condition of human nature. So again, something that uh, Narsai is going to do is that the he, he 
places the Canaanite woman within this larger lineage of, of the Bible and gives her uh, this uh, history. And, and she reminds Jesus of who she is. Um, and I think it's, it's very interesting how audacity is being used. Audacity has been punished, but she's also, because of her boldness, she's being saved. So it, you can see how the one is undoing the other, which I think, you know, that sort of, um, that uh, doubleness, I think, is very important and links Narcissus thought to other uh, Christian authors. And then finally, um, one of the things that I, that I think is so interesting when we're talking about boldness and women and using women as an example for all Christians is that the poet himself, uh, Narsai, points to her and lauds her as a po and the poetic narrator of this of this particular work is so strong in, in placing her at the center of uh, meditation within this poem, I should say, uh, whereas we know Jacob's poem was definitely performed within the liturgy, uh, Narsai taught at the school of Nisibis, uh, and these, some of these poems, these mamra would be used as teaching tools. Um, so it's both within the liturgy, but also teaching, uh, teaching his students how to exegete scripture. So it's sort of it, it beyond, ju beyond just the liturgy, but we just know less about Narsai's particular context or performance. Um, but I think it's a beautiful passage uh, that connects boldness and love uh, very tightly where he says, a woman very great is your faith and the whole world does not stand comparison with the truth of your love. Your mind seized a strong power against the evil one and you are not overpowered by the strong one who wages war against you. Wise is your heart and shrewd is your inclination to contend and no one knows how to engage in battle more than you. Subtle is your thinking and skilled is your mind to distinguish rightly. And there is no bird whose wing is as swift as your emotions. There is no athlete who knows how to embark upon the contest as well as you do. And no archer who aims at the target as well as your endurance does. Because your love endured and the voice of its entreaty has not grown weak. Behold, I pay your wage for the toils of your faith. And I think this passage brings out a lot of imagery that's not only common to Ephraim, but common to the larger Christian tradition, um, but points to the fact that uh, Narsai has a very particular um, understanding of the human person, uh, where he has here, wise is your heart and shrewd is your inclination, uh, zoe, the stirrings of the heart. And for him, uh, part of what the Canaanite woman represents is that she was, her inclination was rightly ordered towards God. And this is a word that is often uh, has a negative valence, but here we're seeing it used positively that, that she has within her this, um, because of her love, she's directed correctly towards uh, the divine. And I think that, you know, gives us a lot of ground for thinking about uh, the human person in ways that, you know, Narsai could be put into theological conversation with someone like Augustine, I think, on this point and how they understand uh, the human person. But also another set of imagery, if I, I pointed out that Jacob of Sarug uh, uses the, the language of treasury for the Canaanite woman, here we're seeing Narsai use uh, military language. Um, and that's another common theme that both we find in Ephraim, but Narsai really develops it in this poem, is that she's equipped for battle. Uh, and the human person is very much under siege uh, by demons, by the devil, that one has to fight uh, and equip oneself with the, the shield of faith uh, and the virtues, which has connections to other um, Christian authors as well. Um, but I think both of these, so what I wanted to get away from, get from these, this particular case study of looking at these two memra from these two uh, representatives of the West Syriac and the East Syriac tradition is how one biblical story was retold, was, uh, was developed uh, into treatises on the Christian life. Uh, the Christian life is one of uh, great, uh, great audacity, great boldness in the pursuit of faith. Um, and I think uh, these women sort of exist, they, they came to life within these communities and they can't they come to life within this 
poetry. And I think that's uh, something that's uh, distinctive in a way. Um, you know, surely if we look at some of the homilies that are done in this story as well, uh, there, there's so much that there's overlap, but I'm always interested in what the function of poetry uh, does, how poetry allows these women to speak, how it develops their character and allows them to address an audience. Uh, this is a, uh, there, we don't have female Syriac authors, but one of the remarkable things is that there are so many, females are so prominent within its literature. Um, here I'm pointing to poetry and biblical stories, but also within hagiography and with ascetic texts, we, we, we see so much um, made of, of uh, women as models of perfection. Uh, so I, I think it's, this is clearly an important place for understanding uh, gender and women within uh, early Christianity. So I think with that, I wanna turn it over to questions. But I can certainly go on longer. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walsh, for a, just a splendid presentation. Um, there are a couple initial questions, and since you have a sense of the culture and the texture of the Syriac people, it's the Semitic culture, right? So I, I would like to ask a question. I mean, how much of this virtue, uh, which is a Christian virtue, you could attribute to a certain cultural way of being, you know, and, and you see it all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, right? Who are the, these strong women? It, it's Sarah who can laugh in the face of God. It's Rebecca who can manipulate the blessing from Isaac because he's in arrested development after being nearly killed by his own father. Um, you hear today, it's the feast of the protection of the mother of God in Byzantine tradition. And uh, the Marian reading is the shouting of the woman from the crowd, blessed be the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you, right? Uh, we, we, we don't say such outlandish things in public. And uh, uh, well, maybe at the debate a couple nights ago, we talk like that. But anyways, uh, how, much, uh, how much of this is cultural? How much of this is Christian? How much of this is inculturation of Christianity? That's a question I have. So I suppose this is how I approach that question um, and maybe kind of flipping and kind of refining how I would ask the question sure. uh, is that I think, um, you know, older scholarship on, on Sarah Christian often use the term, uh, you know, I think referring to Syriac as being a quote unquote, you know, Semitic form of, of Christianity as if it was somehow not Greek. Or sure. not, and uh, I think one of the the changes, one of the what I try to uh, express and try to, uh, you know, I, I think is that this is a world which was was Hellenized, and I think it's I wouldn't separate, you know, I, I don't I think it's artificial to, you know, this is Christianity arose within a world that was fully Hellenized um, that we can't sort of pick apart, and and also that um, Judaism at this time was, you know, Greek you know, the, the Jewish, sort of the sort of it's, so I hesitate to separate where it's coming from. Is it coming from this tradition or that? I think it's part of the, the, the soil of, of how these Christians are, are articulating and finding a language to speak about the Christian faith. And we see that within the writers of the New Testament, they're using and redefining Greek language to express what they are, what they have experienced and what they are, um, see what they saw happen, what they're witnessing. Um, uh, I mean, what they're, they're trying to find words to express uh, the Christian belief. So I think to what I would emphasize in what you said is I think this is something that they're seeing in figures like Sarah, the matriarchs, um, that there is a common, you know, these, these virtuous women do have certain traits in common. I mean, we were talking about Tamar as a Sebastian Brock has uh, translated Jacob's poem on Tamar, and it's a wonderful meditation on uh, boldness as well there. Um, so I think it links these, I think it links, um, it's, a, it's a, a linking virtue that they're seeing. Um, yeah, I don't know where that addresses everything that you... Maybe it's not a Semitic culture, and that's, it's, it's, it's the biblical culture out of... Yeah. Springs. yeah. It's a biblical, but I think, you know, another thing that I'm interested in is that um, some of the, the interlocutors that I've had are classicists writing about women within Greek tragedies and oh. how women there uh, speak and act in ways that are not 
sanctioned for other, you know, you don't want your, your wife or your daughter to be acting like that. Um, and one of the questions that I, I think about and I, I struggle with in some of these texts is where are these women exceptional and where are we supposed to emulate them? Um, and I think that's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. Uh, I, I have more questions, but uh, I know there are more questions than mine. So um, question from Ann Slatterfield. Are there any evidence of women being in Narsai school? Why do you think that Narsai chose to enlarge biblical stories about women? Um, so certainly we know that he would have been, you know, on, on Sunday services that women would be present. Not that I, we don't have evidence that they would be students within the school of Nisibus, but certainly we can't, you know, that women would be at least hearing some of his poems. We're a little less sure on what days they would have been performed. Um, so certainly women could have heard this, um, uh, but it would be more on Sundays and sort of um, liturgical sort of uh, his role in the liturgy. Sure, sure. Uh, Monica asks, um, could you speak more uh, concerning the difference between uh, our two authors on women in their poetry of Mary, if there is any, um, in their homilies on the nativity, there is a great difference in their treatment of Mary, uh, Monica states, for Jacob, Mary's boldness is strongly expressed in how she talks back to the angel and not be persuaded to consent until receiving satisfactory answers when Jacob praises his prudence and wisdom. But Narcissus Mary does not speak at all during the Annunciation <laughs> except to praise God. Is there no attempt on her side to the question at all? Even to quote her own question as quoted in scripture, how can this be? Do you see this as a fundamental difference in their treatment of women and their necessary boldness, simply a reaction to their different Christologies or something else? I think that's a fabulous question. Um, I mean, part of, you know, I, I have sort of multiple reactions to the, the question. I think there's also, you know, for Narsai, we have about 81 extant uh, memre. For Jacob, we have somewhere between 300 and 400, and there are some that are attributed that we can question. So we have more evidence for Jacob. Um, I did, I, I, for a edited volume or a translation volume that's coming out, I did translate the Mamer on Mary. And I was partly hoping uh, to understand a bit more about Narsai's approach to Mary. And she gets uh, very few lines. Um, it's mainly a very complex and very intricate articulation of his Christology. Um, so I, I don't have a full answer to that yet. It is a question that I have on the table. Um, I would say, and I don't like to overgeneralize, but I think because Jacob is so clearly strongly uh, within the, the ecclesial community, um, he does treat women more often. Um, one of the things that's I think remarkable about this particular memoir that I translated for Narsai is that he doesn't deal with many stories um, about women. So it's simply not uh, something that comes up as often um, Narsai has a slightly different artistic style. Um, so I suspect there's probably something to do with Christ his Christology, but also just the topics that he tends to pick. But that is a question I am still thinking and still developing my question, my, my position on. Hmm. Very good. Um, can you comment a bit up, up on the poetics of these prose poems, such as observations of meter, meter rhythm, alliteration, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say something that's very important for this poetry is alliteration. And these, um, you know, you'll often see, especially Jacob does this quite a bit, he'll start the line with the same word. And that for me is a very important place in terms of, um, uh, you know, his emphasis. And I think even here, I've tried to show a little bit about where he's repeating certain terms. There's a music to that and often just using the same, um, you know, same sounds even. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the, one of, I think a beautiful but very hard poem of Narsai to read is on Eve and the reproof of, uh, her, da of her daughters. And when he's speaking about the serpent, there's like the sibilance, like the multiple like S sounds uh, come through. Um, so I think, you know, playing upon, uh, for me, the most important is when it comes to uh, playing upon sounds and common words and, and rhythm, um, I think is very important there. Hmm. Um, which of Narsai's works would you recommend as a good starting point for someone who hasn't read anything? Ooh, 
Um, <laughs> I would say, I mean, I think uh, one would certainly be um, the reproof of Eve, which is, I mean, partly part of the problem is that a lot of Narsai, it, it's coming out. There is a, a translation project underway to translate all of uh, Narsai's poetry, but a lot of it hasn't appeared. I mean, there's some in French and uh, German translations, but I think, um, you know, I, I think I would look forward to those volumes that will be coming out. Um, I also gave a link in the PDF to Gorgias Press has started uh, also, he, they have several translations of Jacob of Saru, but there's more and more of Narsai as well. And I would just start anywhere. Um, you know, I, I think with those volumes would be good. The, the, there is an article that has a translation of the reproof of Eve's daughters that I think is, uh, I think theologically very powerful. Um, not, uh, it's, it's a very negative portrayal of women. Um, so I, I often think about, you know, I've written about this poem on the Canaanite woman as a counterbalance to his depiction of Eve, which is so strongly uh, kind of gendered um, against women. So. Yeah, so that's kind of the counterweight. Yeah. 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 And I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting where you see authors who have, you know, they're capable of writing these diatribes, you know, uh -huh. Narcisse's poem on Eve is, you know, it, it I think Susan Harvey is, it, it, he says things that are reminiscent of what Jerome says about women sometimes, but here he's also praising a woman. So um, it's, there's, I think there's both. He's a complex person. Yeah. That's good. Uh, were um, these narratives, were they sung, read, acted out? Uh, just describe uh, what we know about that. They'd be recited. Um, by a, and probably a single male voice. So again, that's interesting, especially with Jacob's poetry, where you have um, voices, and just here you have her voice. How would you know? You'd have to be listening carefully to know when they're switching between uh, the narrator's voice and uh, these women's voices. Yeah. Do you think they would intone differently, or no, they would just perhaps? Yeah. Could have. Yeah. No cues. Um, the. Uh, what are, like if Josiah Andrews asks, uh, what would be the major worldview in influences? Probably like cosmology, right? Uh, like Plato contributes much to the Greek Christian worldview. What would be the influencers for these authors, right? Uh, that perhaps changes the, their trajectory of their theological outcomes. So I think the, that's a wonderful question. I think part of the complexity for that when we're talking about Syriac literature is how that changes over the centuries, um, partly because of the translation of Greek texts into Syriac. Um, and, but it's also one of the tantalizing questions is that we, we don't always know. I, I think the Bible is clearly um, uh, shaping the worldview of these authors. And that's one of the clearest uh, sources. So I think um, that is very, I think sometimes I'm, I'm interested in, I, I pointed to uh, Narsai's language of inclination. Adam Becker has a wonderful uh, article on this because that also shows up in rabbinic literature. Um, so, but it's hard to trace out, uh, you know, these, these sort of what they're reading and, and we don't know as much, only that they seem to be steeped in the Bible. Um, yeah. So that's what we can be sure about. Um, and then later generations as Evagrius will be, you know, that you have more of a, uh, you know, we can say more. For someone like Narsai, of course, you have, uh, he's going to be very influenced not only by Ephraim, but also by Theodore of Mopsuestia because he's at the school of Nisibis when those texts are being translated. Um, so that's another very important author for him as well. Uh, just a, a question from uh, Jeanette about their self-identity. Did Narsai and Jacob consider themselves literary authors as well as theologians? Was their work received as high or low art? Yeah, that's an interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the, I, I taught a course in the spring on poetry within the Christian tradition, we read Latin, late antique poetry alongside Greek and, and Syriac. And one of the um, 
I think for Syriac authors, I, poetry has, you know, for, and I think uh, the lecture on Ephraim stresses that poetry is the proper medium for doing theology. Um, it's a privileged uh, genre. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, what we, we were so often thought, taught to think that theology happens in prose. And, and I think these figures really, they're, they're biblical exegetes, they're teachers, they, they're, um, uh, you know, they have a flock of Christians that they're, they're bishops there. Um, so I think they're, they're bridging those categories that sort of the, but the poet does have authority. Um, one of the fascinating parts when you read more and more of Jacob's poems, you notice these very complex introductions. Um, and he speaks about himself. And sometimes he'll, he'll uh, it, it's usually in seeking kind of inspiration, asking, uh, you know, God's blessing to speak through him uh, and to think about the poetic, the authority of the poetic word. I think often, you know, if, if you're interested in this question, I think the introductions of, of Jacob's poems are one of those places where you see uh, the poet, the poet's self-identity being unfurled. Um, and you sometimes even, Jacob says that the, the women, the characters that he's, that are asking him to tell their story. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think that's, uh, but they're very much, they're writing for the church. They're writing for the church, but so are, I mean, Origen and uh, Chrysostom and, um, you know, there's this, that's where they're being. But I think it is an interesting question because, you know, and, and Jeffrey Wicks has been working on this, is that that idea of, of where these po poems live beyond the liturgy, uh, the, you know, sort of small study circles and things like that. Um, yeah, 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 that's interesting. I think it also has to do just a comment with the, the odd place that poetry occupies today. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't know how to place it. It's been sort of restricted to the academy, but it, it you know, really traditionally has had this sort of popular variant. You know, mm -hmm. one comment, to, I think, when at uh, the inauguration of Barack Obama, I uh, read an article by a poet who was upset that the poet laureate uh, was in the wrong place, you know, in the program that she should have been with Beyonce. <laughs> reciting her poem because it's it's more music than it is this stilted preamble before an inauguration speech right and so i don't know if we we yeah. lack the categories yeah. one one of the things i would say is that um you know christianity and i i've written this i i you know i think it arose in a world where where poetic speech was everywhere um and people imbibe you know when i was just talking to my students today about um in the ancient world having memorized Mm -hmm. poem. You know, Augustine has imbibed and he can recite large portions of Virgil. Um, you know, our Greek uh, patristic authors know their Homer. This is a world in which poetry had power and um, and prestige and, and it was very important medium. And then, yeah, I do. I wonder, um, you know, what kind of takes that place. You know, I think music in some, in some is a maybe a modern equivalent. Uh, people know lots of lyrics. Um, but certainly in the Syriac world, it had a special because it was the site of, of theology. It was the site of theological reflection and thought. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good. Yeah, exactly. Um, you pointed out, Patrick Conlon asks, that some of the language used by Narsai to describe the women was militaristic. Mm -hmm. There was also language of athleticism, toil, wages. Etc. It seems that they are traditionally masculine themes. Mm -hmm. Do Narsai and or Jacob ever suggest that the women taking on these traits as manly, like Andreos or whatever, or masculine as in Paul and Thecla, or yeah. the martyrdom of Perpetua, or the life of St. Melanie, um, or are these traits being described as feminine, right? In other words, are these virtues described as feminine traits for women to imitate, or are they general Christian virtues for both men and women to imitate? Good. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think it's, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're pointing to texts um, that really do play up that language. And there's a, there's a um, kind of uh, women have to become manly uh, to be virtuous. And here, I think you see that same imagery being evoked, but they're not, they're not quite as explicit as some of the texts that you're mentioning. Um, I think it really is the, that women can use, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, fully within a woman's purview to, um, you know, to, to have this type of um, strength. Um, so yeah, so I think it's an interesting, it, it's sort of a place where there's less of an explicit 
Um, but I wonder, I mean, it's something to look out for. I mean, in terms of the larger corpora of these authors, it would be interesting to go, I haven't gone through and looked specifically for that yet, but it's a, it's a good question to keep in mind. Yeah. But nothing that's coming to mind, at least in these poems. Yeah. Um, does it, uh, just a question I have, I mean, in terms of boldness, I mean, uh, and advocating for a, a posture of prayer, right? These are texts of prayer. Do we see these authors breaking the fourth wall and telling us to have the same boldness before the Lord? Um, does that happen? Uh, or are we just sort of watching it in a third person way? Uh, both of these authors will, you know, in uh, exhort the listener to, to have this same faith. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that exhortation, and it happens at the end. Yeah, at the end of these poems. So that's the, the goal. Yeah. Did, um, did any of this, uh, was there any crossbreeding in this Christian literature with the making of the Quran at all? Um, I mean, I think that's a very complex question. I think especially, you know, one of the um, aspects of the study of, of Syriac literature that's so important is that these are Christians who are living, um, you know, who are experiencing the rise of Islam. And certainly, um, you know, we have Syriac literature that's reacting uh, to Syriac, and there are certain, um, uh, at least how, I, I think this is a becoming a, a more and more um, important site of scholarship, and I think um, that is a live question that's being debated. Um, but I do think uh, we certainly have very early texts where Syriac Christians are. Um, uh, Michael Penn has written on this quite a bit, as well as uh, other authors, um, Stephen Shoemaker. So I think there are there are scholars working on that question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's very just. Um, let me see if we have just one more question here. Is there an etymology? Is there an uh, etymological link between boldness and endurance happening at all? This was with Deacon Lawrence Dugoni. There seem to be central. Are they playing off each other? Um, it's a, I mean, endurance is an interesting, um, yeah, sort of the the strength, but it's more. I, I would say the the play is with. Um, sort of audacity, audacity and like the, um, the kind of the not quite the same uh, link with strength. I'm trying to think about how I would um, think about that. Um, you know, something that we were talking about is the Patasia, which is transliterated into Syriac. And that's something that I looked, uh, looked at doesn't come up in um, Narsai, um, except in certain liturgical places, um, but not, not that I'm, I'm seeing within the Syriac. Okay. And then Bruna Aslani asked, this is a question, does this theme continue to have influence in later Christian writings? Or does this just sort of drop out or? Um, I haven't done as much work on the reception um, of this. It's certainly something Other that I'm you receiving it right now. Yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, not that I I have looked at, um, but I, it is a question I would be interested in in pursuing because um, I think certainly you know we might have to expand and I sort of think about a constellation of terms for boldness, um, but I do think there are ways in which you could carry this forward and think about how later mm -hmm. figures are um, being construed as being zealous, maybe um, certainly as a part of of faith. Hmm. Very good. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned that there were trans, uh, there were transcriptions, hand transcriptions happening until the twentieth century. Uh, that Narsai's poems are still being were still being uh, copied. Yeah, yeah, hand copied. What what would be the reason for hand copying into the twentieth century? Is it just a devotional practice, or these are trained scribes? Yeah. Um, actually, I had the privilege when I was in the Netherlands a few years ago, I went to um, a Syriac Orthodox 
church in Hengelo. And I actually met a trained traditional scribe. And he I actually have, he gave me one of his boards that he, he used to make the lines on the manuscripts to write out. And he had just completed a full copy of Jacob of Sarug's uh, poems. Um, uh, and I mean, it was just, it was beautiful. It was stunning, the sort of, uh, the skill level. Um, yeah. So I think that reminds us that these aren't, uh, that these are living traditions. This is, I mean, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, when I said I was presenting on the Canaanite woman, the archbishop, you know, just recited Jacob's poem to me. Um, so this is not, these aren't, they are being copied and preserved and, um, you know, the, the textual quality of it's, um, of course, you know, they are printed and they are printed editions of Narcise text, but um, where the hand copying is still uh, done. Yeah. Wow. Still being done today, even in diaspora. So, yeah. Well, I mean, Professor Walsh, thank you so much um, for this fantastic presentation and for helping break and open for all of us the text that many of us don't have access to just for a lack of the language skills that you've been um, toiling away at over the years. So really appreciate even you showing us these contingent texts um, that have survived. Uh, and uh, thank you for this exciting presentation. And thank you again, um, Father Andrew. Uh, we never have time to get to all of the questions, um, but we're grateful to each of you participating today for um, helping uh, to, to spur our conversation along further um, with, the, with the questions that you're bringing to us. Um, so uh, once more, please join me in thanking Professor Walsh. It's unfortunate we don't have uh, the possibility of her seeing each of our claps, um, but you can raise your hands uh, on the participant list here um, to let her know your appreciation or send your comments through the Q&A and I'll be sure that she gets those um, at the end of the evening. Um, and I would invite you to join us uh, uh, again uh, on Thursday, November 12th, as we invite Archbishop Boris Gudziak um, for a, a presentation that will look at the direction of Eastern Catholic theology today, um, providing a pastoral perspective for the 21st century. Um, and join us for uh, many other upcoming events, exploring and engaging the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, I'm grateful to each of our co-sponsors who have helped make this event a success, either by financially supporting it or by advertising it. Um, and I invite you to support us as well. Help us to get word out about all of our upcoming events um, to your friends, uh, to those within your networks. Um, follow us on social media, um, join our mailing list and share our materials further. Um, I invite you also to become a financial supporter today by um, donating at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. So um, one more time, a word of gratitude on behalf of all of us viewers to uh, Professor Walsh um, and invite you to join us again in the future. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.